We're supposed to live a perfect peace life in a crumbling world. We're going to look now in the fifth hour when God pours his judgment on earth. Chapter 13 starts talking about Babylon, chapter 24 to 27. In Bible commentators, it's called the little apocalypse. It's kind of like a mini version of Revelation. And this is how I illustrate it. Beware of the coming wrath of God. God, the creator, is coming to the earth. When he comes, it's called the second coming, and his introduction is seven years of everything you're seeing starting right now on steroids. By the end of the seven years, the air is so thick of smoke that people can't breathe. The sun is shining so brightly that it's burning everyone. I mean everyone. Uh, all of the creatures, all of the fish die, it says. All of them die. So all those little boats off Jeju are not going to have anything to go after. Everything in the ocean dies. The, the green grass, there's no more green grass. The trees are burning. I, and that's not even the worst part. God opens a pit that is in the center of the earth. It's called the pit. Ezekiel introduces us. Uh, I mean, I'll just put it off to the side. It's called the pit. Everybody that's ever lived in all of history is there right now, alive. And the worst of all the fallen angels, the ones that are so deadly that they just kill everything in sight, they're in a place near it, under chains, Tartarus it's called. So there's a pit in Tartarus. God opens the pit. And we're going to see that next hour and lets them all out. So this is a very exciting chapter. Uh, or I mean class. So let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that as we look at your plan for the future, we'd realize that you want us to know your plan. You want us to know that you will right all wrongs. There's no sin that's going to go unpunished. There's no evil and wickedness that you're going to overlook. But for all who call on your name, you will put the whole record of our sinful lives onto your son, our savior. So what a thrill it is to look at your wrath and to think that we're not going to face it forever. We're free from your wrath. Thank you. Bless our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's jump into uh, chapter 13. We've gotten through chapter 12. Chapter 13 is Babylon. I'll show you my Bible. Um, the burden against Babylon. This word burden is when God starts prophetically talking about his plan for the future for a nation. Uh, Babylon, Babylon, we, we meet Babylon in chapter 11 of Genesis. Remember, Genesis gives us everything. Genesis uh, tells us about first the earth was created, and then after the earth, the universe, the stars and, and everything else was created, and then humanity came along after the animals. So it's just amazing after part of the animals. But all of a sudden, and, and then we find where sin came from, and then we find where all the nations come from. So Genesis, I mean, I can't wait till you guys get to study that. It's, it's, it's the orientation for everything in life. Well, by the time we get to the nations, that's chapter 10 of Genesis, and sin is chapter three. And humanity, you know, is one and two comes in there. Uh, all of this is in one and two. But by the time we get there, the next thing we find is the Tower of Babel. Babel. That's Babylon. And so Babylon is, Babylon is in the Bible for you to understand it. Babylon is a place. It's an event. But it's also a philosophy uh, or a, it, it's a culture, actually, the Babylonian culture. And basically, the Babylonian culture has two parts, religion and materialism. That's what Babylon is. Babylon is. It's this idea that man can make his own way to God. What was the Tower of Babel? It was some kind of a pyramid thing that went up, it was a ziggurat. I'm not a good drawer, but here's this ziggurat. And they kept building it up, and they said, we're gonna find our own way to God. 
that's religion. And also, they spoke the same language. They could do anything they wanted to do. It was this uh, materialism that we can uh, build and do and have anything we want. So God starts in chapter 13, he's talking about the place. In chapter 11 of Genesis, he's talking about the event all the way through the Bible, including a little bit later uh, here in chapter 13, he's talking about the culture. And if you want to know what Babylonian is, Babylonianism is, most of all, it's when Jesus says, love not the world or the things in the world. So worldliness, Satan hijacking religion and materialism uh, that you live for physical things. Okay, uh, if you, you keep reading here to verse five, they come from the far country, the end of heaven, the Lord and his weapons of indignation destroy the whole land. Now look what happens in verse six. Whale, now here's code, the day of the Lord. What, what is the day of the Lord where God, verse 11, punishes the whole world. Verse 13, he shakes the heavens. The earth will move out of their place. Verse 9, the day of the Lord. Verse 10, the stars and constellations don't give their light. The sun gets darkened. The moon gets darkened. What is this? Well, that's what the day of the Lord is this. Isaiah 13 describes the day of the Lord. The Old Testament prophets use day of the Lord to describe both, remember this prophetic foreshadowing, the near and far, both near historic judgments, like Babylon's gonna get it, and far divine judgments. We call that the tribulation. So basically, uh, Revelation 18 is all about Babylon being destroyed. Ultimately, that's Revelation 18. Revelation 17 is about the false religion of the Antichrist being destroyed. So God is dealing with Babylon cover to cover in the Bible. It's called the day of doom, the day of vengeance, the day of God's wrath, the day of visitation, the great day of God Almighty. There we are in Revelation 16, 14. Joel spends so much of his prophetic time talking about it, and Paul sums it all up in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7. You know what verse 7 says? In flaming fire taking vengeance on his enemies. That's how Jesus describes the tribulation. So that's the day of the Lord. Now, what are the details? The little apocalypse. Apocalypse, apocalypsis, is the word for unveiling. The whole book of Revelation is called the, the book of the apocalypsis of Jesus Christ. That's the Greek word, apocalypsis. It means uncovering or unveiling. So Jesus gets revealed in Revelation. But what's interesting is that when people say apocalypse, they're not talking about Jesus it's become synonymous with a disaster. In America, when it snows too much, they, they call it a, a apocalyptic snowstorm. When there's a big earthquake, they call it an apocalyptic earthquake. When there's a, kind of like a financial downturn, they call it an apocalyptic financial event. What is it? Well, look how the Bible describes it. In chapter 24, verse one, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste and distorts its surface. Verse 18, the foundation of the earth is shaken. Verse 19, the earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth shakes. The earth reels to and fro like a drunkard, totters like a hut. You can read this, this whole, uh, the whole sequence all the way through. Right in the middle of it, look at this. See, see, God is saying, I want you to know I have everything under control. This is my plan. I'm going to apocalypsis. I'm going to reveal Christ. The whole purpose 
of the tribulation is to reveal Christ as the Messiah. Here, do you want me to do a drama? I'm going to show you the ending of the tribulation, okay? I'm not very dramatic at all. The Antichrist organizes the whole world. The Antichrist is going to be the leader of the revived Roman Empire. The revived Roman Empire, you can see it all around you. Uh, we'll talk about it uh, a little bit later. It's, it's Western Europe, Northern Africa, the Middle East. That's kind of the center of attention. And the Antichrist gets the whole world to march on Israel. And he keeps penning them in until all the Jews are in Jerusalem. And the Jews are in Jerusalem, and Zechariah 12 to 14 says two-thirds of them are slaughtered. So this is like Hitler on steroids. All the Jews are in one place, and they're killing them off. And only one-third of them are left. And Isaiah 14 says, I mean, uh, Zechariah 14 says, as the Antichrist is closing in, killing all the Jews, his army goes all the way up to Armageddon. They're, that's how many there are. They're, they're stretching 60 miles up into the valley. As they're closing in, the last third that are left do this. Help. And at that instant, Jesus breaks through, comes past Armageddon, comes to Jerusalem, and it says in Zechariah that Jesus coming makes the eyes of every soldier melt, their tongue melts, their skin melts off their bodies. It's a horror movie. You ever seen Indiana Jones in the last cruise, or the, where he found the ark, you know, and they, I mean, it's dumb, it's not true, it's silly, it's, but it illustrates people melting. And that's what happens when Christ returns. And what prompts it is, they cry out for who we were talking about last hour, the Messiah, the Christ to come. And so look, look at what Isaiah predicts they're going to be doing. They're praising the one uh, who, who is their God, who they waited for him. He will save us. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice. Look at verse 8. He will swallow up death forever. The Lord shall wipe away all tears. Does that ring a bell? That's exactly what the New Testament says that heaven is going to be like. We get to Isaiah 26. Look at the context of the whole book. We've been talking about it. It's a shalom, shalom, perfect peace. You will keep him in perfect peace, shalom, shalom, whose mind is stayed on you, who trusts in the Lord. Wow. Your dead shall live together with my dead body, verse 19. They will arise, those who dwell in the dust. All of this stuff. And then what follows the second coming of Christ? The millennium. Did you know 20% of the Old Testament prophets are about the millennium? What's the millennium? It's when Christ the Messiah literally rules on earth. Do you ever listen to Christmas carols? It says, and he shall uh, dwell on the throne of his father David. That's one of the choruses. I used to wonder, what? why do we have to go... Father David. What is that Christmas carol talking about? Isaiah 27. Israel is going to get all the promises that God gave them. The restoration of Israel. It says that, that they are going to be, the time is going to come when everybody in the world is going to be worshiping the Lord in Jerusalem. Not firing missiles at it. Not doing suicide bombers at it. Not having, you know, the United Nations and the U.S. and Britain defend it. All the nations of the world are going to be coming to see God in Jerusalem. When is that? I'm glad you ask. Okay. We have 36 minutes now left for prophecy. The Bible gives us a map from right now. You are right here. And this is where you could be someday in the future. By the way, I told you when I teach this, you know, I always go through the plan of salvation. This is when that, that faculty member at UC Berkeley sat up and he went, this isn't boring. And he started listening because he said, wow, I don't want to go through that tribulation and be, you know, incinerated by the Antichrist. I want to go to heaven. And so... These are the, what I call the 12 steps from now to then. 
Uh, the rapture is the resurrection of the church, the rise of the Antichrist. He makes uh, a treaty with Israel. 144,000 Israelite believers uh, become missionaries. They can't be destroyed. They speak every language of the world. They share the gospel. While they're working, the Antichrist rises to power, breaks his, uh, his covenant with Israel. Israel begins to seek God. Jerusalem is attacked. Jesus returns to rescue after two-thirds of them are killed. Then comes what Jesus talked about, the sheep and goat judgment. Uh, Old Testament tribulation believers are resurrected, the thousand-year reign of Christ. At the end of it, everybody rebels. You know what the millennium's about? You can have a perfect world. You can have a perfect leader, Jesus Christ. You can have no pollution, no poisonous animals, no, no crime, and people still don't want God. A perfect society doesn't make perfect people. Only God can make people perfect. So Satan is judged. Unbelievers are judged. God creates a new universe, and we go into heaven. Okay, that's interesting. How does that apply to what we're seeing now? How does God see the Gaza war? Have you ever thought about that? Do you ask yourself that? Well, if you look through the Bible, God has already given us a map in the Bible. It's in Daniel chapter 9. The Bible offers a map of the future that's accurate, a guide to understand the past, the present, and the future. And God Almighty rules from heaven all the affairs of man, and he gave Daniel in Daniel 9. By the way, who's the only prophet Jesus quotes by name when he talks about the future? Daniel. Daniel was his favorite prophet about the future, about the end of the world. And what Daniel says is, this is all there will be in the world till the end. This is it. So what does Daniel say that's illustrated in the book of Revelation? Now, one of the things I teach at Word of Life is Revelation. If you ever go to New York or Florida, uh, year one for every BI student is Revelation. Here's a summary in one minute of the whole book of Revelation. Revelation 1 is about us here on earth. 4 and 5, we go to heaven. 19, we see us in heaven. 6 to 18 is a tribulation, the second coming of Christ, the millennium, the great white throne, and heaven. Now let me show you what God says is happening. The next event for us is the rapture. John 14, Luke 24, Acts 1, all talk about us being caught up before the Lord. The Bema seat of Christ is when we are judged for what we lived for him. Then comes the wrath of God in the great tribulation, the second coming of Christ to deliver uh, the nation. Jesus returns for Israel. That's what the second coming is. Jesus rescues Israel. The whole purpose of the second coming is for Jesus to rescue Israel from all of that's going on of Satan trying to destroy them. Then Jesus actually rules on earth from Jerusalem for a thousand years. He builds a visitor center that's 50 square miles. Talk. There are eight chapters of Ezekiel that describe the visitor center. Ezekiel 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48. Actually, nine chapters that describe this visitor center. It's called the Millennial Temple. And all the world for 1,000 years has to visit Jerusalem like we just saw in chapter 26 of Isaiah. During that 1,000 years millennium, they have to come to Jerusalem. If they won't come, it won't rain on their cabbage field. Do you understand that? No crop will grow. During the millennium, everybody's agriculture. They're all like Jeju, you know, the, these little rock walled fields everywhere you look. If you won't come to Jerusalem once a year, your crops won't grow. It actually says that in Isaiah. Unbelievable. That's what the millennium is. They rebel, the great white throne judgment, and then we have dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. So there's a one minute survey of heaven. How do we get this? Jesus explained what Daniel said in Matthew 24. Then what Jesus explains, he comes back and, and narrates to the apostle John in the book of Revelation. Here's what Jesus said. All these are the beginning of sorrows, birth pains. But when you see all these things, look, that's verse 33. All what things? Well, how does Matthew 24 start? The disciples say to Jesus, I'll read it to you, Matthew 24. 
The disciples, I'm so glad they asked this. Um, it says, and Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly not one stone, Matthew 24, 2, will be left there that's not thrown down. As he sat on the mountain of Olives, verse 3, the disciples came to him privately and said, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They said, what, what is the sign of the end? And Jesus spends all the way through to verse 33 explaining the signs. And he said, when you see all those signs, you know the second coming of Christ is near. Assuredly, I say, the group of people, the generation, will not pass away. The ones that see the signs all at once fulfilled will still be alive when it's done. What were the signs? Well, you can base, I mean, you all know them. The most prevalent sign is deception. That's Matthew 24, 4, 5, 11, 24, Mark 13, 5, 6, 22, Luke 21, 8. War and violence and murder and killing. By the way, the, the parentheses are where they are in Revelation. The white is where they are in Jesus' gospel sermon. Food scarcity. I mean, it's going to come to a time where people are going to be like they are in Gaza Strip right now. People are desperately just searching for food and water. There are going to be pandemics. In fact, God says there are going to be such pandemics that half of all the people on earth are going to die just from the pandemics. Unbelievable. There's going to be hatred of God and persecution. There are going to be quakes. Did you see they've had a 1,000 earthquakes? Well, they had by yesterday. In Iceland, they said, oh, we're going to have a big volcano. And there's going to be, right now, Italy is on alert. There's a, a volcano that hasn't erupted in 100 years that's huge in Italy that is scaring about a million people that live around it. There are going to be global fires and smoke and gloom and volcanoes. The Bible talks about solar flares near-Earth objects, asteroids, rocks landing on the Earth. There are going to be hurricanes and typhoons. It talks about, in Luke 21, that there's going to be storms so big that it's going to make people die of fear. The ocean is going to die. Water's going to run out. And then look at look how the last sign. There's going to be an alien invasion. And guess what? Captain America, the Hulk, uh, you know, and Thor are not going to be able to stop it. And neither will, you know, Iron Man or Dr. whatever his name was, you know, uh, the one that does all the witchcraft. What are the trends? Jesus said, you're going to see birth pangs. What are they? Number one, global diseases are going to get more and more lethal. There have always been global diseases. It's just they're going to get wider and deeper. Global warming... If you look at the tree rings of ancient trees like California sequoias, the bristlecone pines that grow in the mountains, you can detect thousands of years of environmental change. And what you see is there are, are dry and hot years and there are wet and growy years. And, and what global warming has been on a cycle, but guess what? It's gonna get stuck on hot. You know, if you ever, if you have your uh, stove uh, dial, it's going to get stuck on high. And global warming is going to get hotter and hotter and hotter. Global water shortages are going to get worse and worse and worse. It says that people are going to die for no water in Revelation. Food scarcity is going to get more frequent. Have you thought about the fact that, not here, but in the major food producing places, they're using genetically modified seeds. Do you know what that means? It means you can't plant a seed and grow anything. You can only buy one from them. They make them so you can't replant the corn, the wheat, the anything. They've genetically modified it so it's disease resistant and non-propagatable. Imagine what happens if something happens to Monsanto the one that makes all the GMO seeds? What happens when they don't sell you seeds? You can't grow anything. Now, a lot of resistance all over the world is to that. You know, all the European Union, they don't want, and I don't think they probably use much here, but in the huge commercial farms that produce half the world's food, they use that stuff. Uh, global conflicts, I mean, do I even need to comment on that? Did you know that arms sales, this was the biggest year of arms sales? never has more weaponry been built than this year. 
more than World War II, more than World War I, more than Korea, more than, than Vietnam, more than the Gulf War this year. Go global conflicts are getting bigger and deadlier. Global hatred for Christ, who is the king of the what? Jews. Jesus Christ is the king of the Jews. There is more hatred for Christ, Christians, and the Jews than any time in history right now. There's a more concerted hatred, and it's only going to get more personal. And by the way, we're going to get roped into it. It talks about the saints uh, and the Jewish people uh, hated. And by the way, global tracking. Uh, Bonnie and I travel. We, we rent cars like that car out there. I remember we were in Thailand, and I stuck the, I, I pulled the gas uh, hose out, put it in the car, and just then my phone went ding. And I looked down, and it was my credit card company. It said, someone is using your card in Thailand. And I thought, wow. My, my credit card, I poked into the um, gas um, machine there to buy gasoline. It went up to the top of the building through their little radar dish up to a satellite, went down and went to Omaha, Nebraska. That's where every credit card transaction in America is processed, in Omaha, Nebraska. It went there. And in Omaha, they said, oh, they live in Colorado. Their card is being used in Chiang Mai. I'm not sure they should, someone might have stolen it. And so they texted me. MasterCard knew where I was. They knew my phone number. They knew what I just did. And they knew how to contact me. Did you know that's nothing? We don't even think about that. Did I say anything revolutionary? No. That, all of you. I mean, Facebook knows where you are right now if you use Facebook. You know, Apple, if you have an Apple phone, it knows right where its phone is. We don't think anything about that except that's never been possible until your generation. Never. That was unknown. Th that means right now that two-thirds of the world is constantly being tracked at all times. Everybody that has a cell phone, somebody knows where they are all the time. And your telecom, your, your phone provider, that's only going to get more complete. So basically what this little apocalypse in, in chapter 24 to 27 and Jesus' explanation of it is, Jesus said that you'll know it's the end of the world when all the birth pains, these signs, become more visible. Guess what? Uh, you can look on Facebook Live and see on your phone everybody that's broadcasting on Facebook Live right now on a global map. There are people on every continent in every people group of the world that are broadcasting their kid riding or playing soccer or a concert. Everything that happens is becoming visible to everybody at once. Then these events are going to get closer together. You know, the, the food shortage, the water shortage, whatever. They're going to get more intense. Like right now, everybody's holding their breath. They don't want Iran to step into the Gaza war. They don't want it. Why? Well, look what Iran's goal is. This, this is Iran's chief spokesman. And he says, look at the top. We reject the existence of any Israeli on the earth. That's personal. He said, there cannot be that ethnic group. You talk about genocide. They're saying this at the United Nations every time they get up. Israel should be annihilated. Wow. Now, when Iran threatens to take out Tel Aviv, does God care? You bet. Because, uh, you know, they're threatening more and more since that's the week after the Gaza thing started. But look what the newspaper, this Wall Street Journal, the Israel-Hamas war is tilting global power balance in favor of Russia and China. Now think about this. The Bible says, the final war, we call it Armageddon, involves the armies of the East, China, and we know Iran and Russia are involved. This is what 
American News is talking about. Our Navy, you know, America's the biggest military power in the world, just deployed the Navy all the way around the world to prepare. This is not a Christian place. This is a U.S. News, a, a secular outfit, to prepare for WW3. What is that? The world is talking about what the Bible describes. That's fascinating. Here's a summary of what God says. God's word describes Iran's attack of Israel as what starts the end of the world. When is that in the Bible? Well, look at this. This is Daniel 9. This chart, the bottom of it, is what Daniel 9 says. And Daniel 9 says 70 weeks is, is planned by God for your people. There'll be 69 weeks and then a final week. And after the 69th week, Messiah the Prince will be cut off, crucified. Jerusalem will be destroyed, A.D. 70. And then there's this, what we call the interval, the, the gap. And then seven years will be left, we call the Great Tribulation. In the middle of it, the temple will be, that has been rebuilt will be desecrated by the Antichrist. He'll break the covenant. He'll set up the image of himself. And now look, we know for sure the rapture kicks off the seven events, but there are three wars that are talked about in the Bible. So the Psalm 83 war, the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war, and the Revelation 16 and 19. Everyone knows that one, it's called Armageddon. Everyone's kind of heard of this one, it's called the Magog invasion. Few people have heard about this one. When do all these things happen? We don't know, look at all those question marks. The Bible does not give us a complete map. It just tells us Psalm 83 is gonna happen, Ezekiel 38 and 39 is gonna happen, Revelation 16 to 19 is gonna happen. Well, what does it say in Psalm 83? Well, look at this. This is the Psalm 83 war. Moab, now what it is is, in Psalm 83, it lists off geographic area where ethnic groups lived. And all I did is add to it who lives there now. This group of people are not historically contemporaneous. They lived across a time, I mean, Amalek, Amalek is 3,000 years ago. Philistia is 3,000 years ago. Assyria is only 2,600 years ago. You know what I mean? It's, it's like this is across the whole spectrum of Bible history attacking Israel. That group of people never attacked Israel at the same time. But in Psalm 83, they do. So is God going to restore uh, people from the past, or is he going to just use people that are living in the same places that have the same goal? Well, that's what Psalm 83 is. Who lives in all those places? In Moab are the central Jordanians and the Palestinians. The Hagarines are Egyptians because Hagar was the matriarch of uh, Egypt. You know, Hagar comes from Egypt. Gabal, that area, that's Hezbollah. That's northern Lebanon. Ammon, that's the Ammonites. Those are the Palestinians and the people in North Jordan. Amalek, they lived in the Sinai area. They were the Arabs down there. Philistia, that's where Hamas is. Tyre, it's still a part of Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. And Assyria are the Syrians and northern Iraqis. Guess what? All of those people right now are actively thinking about attacking Israel right now. Hezbollah has already started. Uh, the, the Palestinians in Jordan are trying to sneak across into the West Bank. The Arabs of the Sinai are causing Israeli problem, uh, military problems. Uh, the Syrians, Israel and the United States are bombing Syria almost every day. Do you know that? You Americans, your country, American soldiers are fighting Syria right now. Okay, that's Psalm 83. This is the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. This is a little different. This is not a little thing. This is when the Russian army, all of the, what we would call Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, all that, where D Darius is from, okay? Just think your cook, Darius, okay? That area. Iran, do you know what Iran is called in the Bible? Persia. Did you know Daniel says there's a demonic fallen angel, the prince of Persia, who is going to cause 
Iran, Persia, to always want to destroy Israel. Where was, do you remember uh, Haman and the whole destroy Israel thing? He was in what we would call Persia. The, the, the Persians have always been involved in threatening Israel. Algeria and Libya, and then Ethiopia and Sudan come. That's what Ezekiel describes. Now, you're probably asking, uh, what, what could happen? Well, here's one thing. The, the Sarmat missile, you see the battle for Ukraine is going on and Russia is threatening uh, Western Europe because they keep helping the Ukraine. Let me just tell one weapon that might get turned loose. A Sarmat missile travels four and a half miles per second. It's nine times faster than a bullet. One, one missile can destroy 250,000 square miles. One missile could destroy the entire nation of France instantly. That's how deadly these things are. Did you know that Russia now almost every week on their public news station goes like this and says, if you guys keep fighting in U the Ukraine, we're going to use our missiles. They've brought them out. They've loaded them on trucks. They're moving them all over their country. So that's interesting. What, what about us? I mean, this, this is what young people, I love teaching college kids. They always have question and answer. So you don't have to ask this one at the Q&A chapel, okay? I'll just give it to you now. What happens to America according to Bible prophecy? Well, all I can say is America is not mentioned, okay? The Roman Empire is mentioned, China's mentioned, Russia's mentioned, Iran's mentioned, Ethiopia is mentioned. America's not mentioned. You know, if God knew everything in the future, why was he so unable to mention us? Have you ever thought about that? He knew Cyrus by name 150 years before Cyrus was born. He calls him by name. He says he's going to come. Why are we not mentioned? Well, five reasons. Maybe we're just a part of the Antichrist revived Roman Empire. That is very possible. Why? Because the Roman Empire, the final expression of it is Great Britain. Great Britain had the largest empire that's ever been in the world. The sun never set on them. They were global empire. They had a colony. That's us. So we would be by extension. In many Bible prophecy people think we're part of the Roman Empire. Well, what about this? Have you been reading the news? I know you're in Korea, but have you read the news? America now is spending a trillion dollars a year on interest for our debt. That's one fourth of our whole budget, and it's going up fast. The, the interest, you know, interest rates are going up. We could implode financially because of now, since I made that slide, it's gone up another trillion. It's 33 trillion dollars. That's an incomprehensible amount of money. It could be America breaks into smaller groups of states. You're noticing that. They can't even get along in Congress right now. Idaho is trying to take an, an annex part of Oregon. The northern part of California is trying to break off from the southern part and make their own state. You know what I mean? We have all this disunity, and America stops being united and just becomes states. Or we explode. Russia stops threatening and actually launches two to four of those Sarmat missiles. Two of them would cripple the U.S. completely. And by the way, the only country in the world that has an effective missile, anti-missile system, they just used it four days, five, six days ago, is Israel. They're the only one that's ever stopped a ballistic missile in space. The only country in the world is Israel. America does not have the capacity to stop the Sarmat missiles at uh, four miles per second. So we explode, or we fade out. Did you know that Korea, North Korea, could send one little fishing boat off the coast of the United States, open the hatch, let out one of their advanced Scud missiles, just have it go up 120 miles and pop up there. It would send a pulse of electromagnetic radiation down. It would stop all of America's electric grid. If they did one off the West Coast, they'd, they'd cripple the whole country. Or, Right now, America is under a 1,200-year mega drought. It rained recently, but that could happen. What are the dangers of fighting Iran? Well, I mean, all the newspapers, this is not Christian stuff. This is just newspapers in Europe. They talk about the six terrifying steps, this is on October 21st, that could spiral into World War III by the British and U.S. boots on the ground. 
and that Israel gets overreactive. The war spreads to Lebanon. Syria and Russia join forces. Iran starts fighting. The U.S. and U.K. enter the fight. Boy, we've already moved. The two largest ships we have in the world off the coast of Lebanon are right there right now. The largest uh, multi-billion dollar aircraft carriers. And then what if Saudi Arabia is forced to take sides? Uh, there's a clock ticking. Iran will soon have a functioning nuclear weapon. And Israel knows that. And the one thing Israel has committed to is survival. And they, that's why Isaiah 17 is so interesting. Israel might have to bomb Damascus to prove their point. And it says in Isaiah 17, Damascus is destroyed. Will, will this go wider? Will it trigger what we see in Armageddon? Interesting. Here's the last thing. Look, look what's going on right now. Do you recognize these two? This is the president of the second largest uh, nation in the world. India just passed them, you know, China, Xi. And there's Putin. As Xi visits Russia, Putin sees his anti-U.S. world order taking shape, the kings of the east and the kings of the north. The world is headed toward the wrath of God. Did you know God planned all this? God says, I am going to, in Revelation 18, destroy Babylon, the materialism. I'm going to destroy Babylon, Revelation 17, the global religion. I am going to let out of the pit, we're going to see next hour, the demons. What, what should that do to us? Well, let's, let's look. Look in Matthew 25, uh, or Matthew 24. Jesus tells us what you're supposed to do when you know the world's going to end. Now, Martin Luther, the great reformer, put it this way, and I could summarize everything I'm going to say in his sentence. I have only two days in my calendar. I'm going to live today in light of the day I'm going to stand in front of Christ. Now, do you guys really think about that? You're young, you want to finish school, you want to get married, you want to go off and have your career, you want to have a family, you want to have a nice house, you hope, or whatever. But guess what? All of that's important, but someday, all the things we're planning to do today, we're going to have to stand in front of Christ and explain to him why we did all those things. Now, here's what Jesus told us. Chapter 25. Uh, we, chapter 25 of Matthew, the parable of the virgins basically says you've got to be prepared. You don't know when Christ is going to come back. Look at verse 14 of chapter 25. A kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to far country. He called his servants. He gave them talents. What Jesus is saying is, chapter 24 says the world is going to end. Matthew 25 says... Our life is like we have talents, and the Lord wants us to do something for him. And look at verse 21 of Matthew 25. And the Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Jesus says the whole purpose of prophecy is not to scare us. It's not to make us uh, build a bomb shelter. It's to make us get ready for the day we stand in front of Christ. Now, I already said this first week, but I'm going to say it again. Look at 1 Corinthians 3. This is what happens when we stand in front of Christ. He puts everything, remember I told you the story of Burger King and all that. He puts everything into this fire. And verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 3 says, everyone's work will become clear. The day will declare it because it will reveal, be revealed by fire and the fire will test everyone's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he receives a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he will be saved, but through fire. What the Lord says is there are going to be Christians who live their whole life, and everything they live for, all of their collections, all of their hobbies, their photos, all their postings, they put on the conveyor belt. They're not sin. They're just what they spent their time doing. And the conveyor belt goes through the fire. And on the other side, Jesus is standing. And anything that doesn't get burned up because it was temporal and only done for the moment, not for Christ, anything eternal, 
lands in the hands of Christ. And that's what it says is gold, uh, silver, verse 12 of chapter 3. If anyone builds on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, it will endure. The last verse, 2 Corinthians 5.10. And we have three minutes. Here's the moment that it happens. I'll start in verse 9. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. How do you live for the Lord? Simply one thing. Paul says, I taught you how you ought to please God. The only goal in life that lasts forever is me saying, Lord, I just want to please you with my attitude, with my words, what I do with my time. We want to be 2 Corinthians 5, 9, well-pleasing to him. That's my ambition. Why? What's my motivation? For we must all appear. The word all, the Greek word means all. Appear is a very interesting word. Phanerothenai is the Greek word. And what it means is we're going to stand all alone in front of Christ. Did you know most people don't like to stand all alone in front of anybody? The most dreaded thing is public speaking, where you have to get up and make a speech and everybody watches you. Did you know that one by one, every believer is going to be waiting in line and the Lord's going to call us up and we're going to come and it's going to be our moment to stand in front of him. The picture is, it says before, verse 10, the judgment seat of Christ. That's the word bema. In Corinth, if you guys go with, with Steve's trip and you go to Greece, the bema was a raised platform where the judge sat up there or stood up there and people came and stood and looked up at him. That's the picture Jesus gives. And what we do is we get to come when it's our turn and the Lord is going to present to us what was left of our life after it went through the fire. So everything you think and do and say and collect and write and all the people, whatever you do with your life, sin is erased. Everything else in life is collected, put in the fire. Everything that was pleasing to God survives. Jesus collects. And he comes to the front of the podium and we're standing there and he said, this this is yours. This is your life. This is what you did that lasts forever. You know what Martin Luther said? That's all I think about every day. Martin Luther lived to be 63 years old. In his 63 years, he got saved and he led what we call the Reformation, a movement. And people say, how did he keep going, facing death threats, facing persecution, facing everything? And he told us, he said, I just want to stand in front of Christ. Do you know, Isaiah is all about how to live this life. The life that pleases God is a perfect peace life. God says, I want you living that kind of life as the world crumbles, as Russia shakes the nuclear saber, as China shakes the, all their Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, Satan, I want you to live that shalom, shalom life. I have it all planned out. I created everything. I know what Satan's going to do. I have revealed the end of the world so you can see Christ is going to win. And all I want you to do with your life is to please God. That's what prophecy is for. And that's my challenge to you. 